We share our planet with millions of species of wild animals and plants. And they keep us alive. They produce fresh air, clean water, healthy soils. They're used every day to make medicine, food, furniture. And they support cultural, recreational, and tourism pursuits. Yet while they keep us alive, the future of wildlife is in our hands. We alone will determine the fate of the world's wildlife, and with it, our own destiny. Now, you may not know it, but everyone in this room has a critical role to play in ensuring the survival of the world's wildlife. And I'm going to tell you why, but not just yet, because I need to set the scene a little bit. Wildlife-based tourism has many different facets. It includes enjoying wild animals and plants in the air, on the land, beneath the surface of the water. And here's an image for you to, to look at. It's a, an image of some of our most beautiful wild animals and plants, large and small. Now, when you look at an image like this, doesn't it inspire you to want to fight for wildlife? Yeah? OK, those watching the webcast, everybody is nodding their head right now. now what better year than this year, the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, than to take up this fight? Now, you know your industry better than anyone else. You know that wildlife-based tourism occupies a particular niche. You know that it is growing across all regions. You know that it generates jobs. And as was said by Ian Golding yesterday, including in areas that are remote from capital. This includes providing great support to some of our most precious places, our UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Now, WWF just released a report last week, and it says that 93% of natural heritage sites support recreation and tourism, and 91% of them generate jobs. It says that in Belize, 50% of the population is supported by the income generated through reef-related tourism and fisheries. Yet the natural asset that underpins this tourism, the wildlife, is under severe threat. And it's under threat from habitat loss, from pollution, infrastructure, climate change, over-exploitation, illegal wildlife trade. And if we cannot get a handle on these threats, we are going to lose the wildlife. Now, if you lose the wildlife, you've lost your wildlife-based tourism. If you lose your wildlife-based tourism, you have lost your business. Now, I don't have time today to go through all of the threats. I'm going to focus on one. This is a threat that provoke, provoke, uh, is a, poses a grave threat to the world's wildlife, and perhaps the most immediate threat to the world's wildlife. It is one where you can make a critical contribution, and it's one that's captured in goal 15.7 of the Sustainable Development Goals, and that is addressing the issue of illegal wildlife trade. Over the last decade, we have been confronting a surge in illegal trade in wildlife. It is driven by transnational, organised criminal groups who are poaching and smuggling at industrial scales the estimate is that this illegal trade today is worth around $20 billion every year. Now, that ranks it alongside illicit trafficking in narcotics and people. The UN World Wildlife Crime Report estimates that around 7,000 species of animals and plants are being impacted by the illegal wildlife trade across every region. Now, I can't deal with them all today, but I do want to give you a few examples just to give you a sense of the scale, the industrial scale of this illegal wildlife trade. The killing of the African elephant for its ivory is one of the most devastating wildlife crimes. And we saw in a period of just three years, 100 African elephants slaughtered for their ivory. In some places, such as in Central Africa, the killing is so great that we will very soon see local extinctions of the African elephant. 
We had rhino poaching pretty much under control a decade ago. Back in 2006, there were around 60 rhino poached on the African continent. From that point on, it steadily increased. Last year, we had over 1,300 rhino poached for their horn. Now, this is not just affecting well-known species like the elephant and the rhino. This is affecting lesser-known species such as the pangolin. And that's in the left-hand corner of the slide you can see. It's an anteater. It's found across Asia and Africa. It's sought after for its scales and its meat. It's being poached and smuggled at huge quantities. In one seizure alone, 10 tons of pangolin meat was confiscated. 10 tons, that's equivalent to 130 people of my weight in one seizure alone. And I have my staff in Singapore at the moment talking about the illegal trade in freshwater turtles and tortoises. 300,000 were seized in illegal trade over the last decade. Now, there are 7.2 billion people on our planet, and that number is going up. Compare and contrast that to the number of animals that are left on the planet. We have around 400,000 African elephants, around 50,000 Asian elephants. There are about 25,000 rhinos left in Africa, and about 3,500 left in Asia. Vietnam and Mozambique have both lost their last rhino to poachers. There are less than 100 Javan and 100 Sumatran rhinos left on the planet, and there is one male northern white rhino left on the planet, and it is under guard 24-7. There are around 20 to 40,000 African lions, around 350 Asiatic lions, around 7,000 cheetahs, 3,800 tigers, 800 mountain gorillas, and they were profiled in that fantastic documentary, uh, Barunga. You should see it if you haven't. And believe it or not, we are down to 30 vaquita. That's a small porpoise. 30 we're down to. And that is the most endangered cetacean on the planet. There are more people sitting in this conference room today than we have mountain gorillas, Javan, Sumatran rhinos, and vaquitas on the entire planet. Colleagues, we are literally getting down to the wire with a number of these species. If we do not act now, they will be lost, and they will be lost on our watch. Now, this is not just affecting wildlife. This is affecting local people, their livelihoods. It is affecting national economies. It is affecting local, national, and sometimes regional security. Brave rangers are being killed in the field. Local officials are being corrupted. Local communities are being deprived of the opportunity to take their own legitimate development choices. And this is affecting some of our most magnificent places, our UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The Selu Reserve, a World Heritage Site in Tanzania, has been put on the endanger list because of the scale of poaching, in particular of the African elephant, and it's not alone. For the same reason, another 13 World Heritage Sites have been put on the endanger list in Africa. The WWF report I referred to, it says that around 50% of our natural heritage sites are affected by the illegal trade in wildlife, including right here in Thailand, where the Tutlan National Park, part of a World Heritage Site, is being plundered by transnational organized criminal gangs for the Siamese Rosewood. It's reported that over recent years, 150 people, police, rangers, and poachers have been killed in the field in relation to this poaching. And I have seen pictures of Rosewood in this park that have chains wrapped around them to stop these criminals from coming in and cutting down this timber. Now, we are very fortunate that we live in an interconnected world. Uh, you know this better than anyone else. 1.2 million billion, I should say, tourist arrivals a year, 100,000 flights taking off a day, 500 million shipping containers whizzing around the planet every year. We can shift products, including wildlife products, to the four corners of the earth in no time, whether they're legally or illegally acquired. Now, the bad news is that the transnational organized criminal groups who are driving this industrial scale illegal trade are using legitimate forms of transport to shift their contraband. The good news is 
that there is a global collective effort underway to combat this illegal trade. It involves the United Nations, international organizations like Interpol, World Customs Organization, World Bank, philanthropists, the non-government sector, and the private sector. And I just want to share with you, well, before I share this example with you, I'd like to stress one thing, and this is the positive. We are seeing more international cooperation than we ever have in combating this illegal trade. And we are making good progress, including right here in Thailand, but much more needs to be done. And I want to share with you now an example of what we've been doing with the, the private sector. We have been engaging with the transport sector. We've been engaging with airlines, shipping companies, courier companies, cruise liners, to look at what role can the private transport sector play in assisting us in combat the illegal wildlife trade. Now, this was made possible through an initiative of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge, Prince William, who put together a transport task force. And the task force was set up to say, what is it that the private sector, the private transport sector can do to assist us? It met, it came up with a draft declaration, and that declaration was adopted. It was called the Buckingham Palace Declaration because it was adopted and signed in Buckingham Palace. It's now been signed off by 50 transport um, companies, and it sets out what they're prepared to do to combat the illegal wildlife trade. Now, one of the members of the task force was Sir Tim Clark. Sir Tim Clark, who runs, as you know, Emirate Airlines, attended every meeting of this task force. He signed the Buckingham Palace Declaration. He has been educating his staff. He's been informing his customers. And as you can see from this slide, he's even painted a number of his aircraft with wildlife. Sir Tim is leading by example. And I'm sure that there's a price tag associated with this, but I'm equally sure that the costs have been outweighed by the benefits. Now, this week, we're talking about transforming our world, tourism for tomorrow. And today, I am reaching out to all of you to join the fight against illegal wildlife trade. There is a lot that you can do. And I'll just give you four examples. Firstly, you can promote responsible wildlife tourism. You can tell people that love wildlife, don't just tweet about it, get out there, experience it, see it, smell it, feel it. You can inform your customers about the illegal wildlife trade, and in particular, be sure that they are not purchasing either illegally or unsustainably sourced wildlife or wildlife products. You can educate your staff about the illegal wildlife trade. You can empower them to be the eyes and the ears for the police out in the field. You can empower them to inform enforcement authorities when they see anything that is suspicious. But most importantly, you can invest locally. When you either establish or acquire a wildlife-based tourism initiative or venture, you make investment decisions. And I cannot, I cannot stress enough how important it is to engage with, support, and invest in local communities. Experience shows that where local communities have a vested interest in their wildlife, they will be the best protectors of this wildlife. Now, I have just returned from northern Kenya. I was in the Northern Rangelands Trust, and they are pursuing a model of development through conservation. Their financing model includes about 30% of the finance coming from tourism, and that number is going up. They are employing hundreds of local Kenyans. I think the number was around 1,200 locals, all from that region. And I met with a lot of the locals. When I spoke to them, they said that when we look at wildlife, we see that we're getting security. The security is not just for the wildlife, it provides security for the people. They're getting health care. They say, our children are getting educated. They say, our development path is through conservation. Do not touch our wildlife. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Elephant poaching is down 50% in this region, and there's not been a single rhino poached for four years. Now, there are many other examples I could give. The Chitwan National Park in Nepal is another wonderful example, but I don't have time to give it. But what we see is that with wildlife tourism ventures, they are often remote from capitals. You'll be working with rural communities that maybe don't have a lot of opportunities. 
but that presents opportunities for you. If you engage, support and invest in local communities, help lift them out of poverty, you will have the best protectors of wildlife. You will have the best protectors of your business and your wildlife tourism venture. Now, you've got a choice, basically. You can choose to engage with and support local communities, to invest in local communities, to help lift them out of poverty in a way that is mutually supportive and self-sustaining, as opposed to poaching, which puts you in a poverty spiral. Or you can choose not to engage with local communities. You can choose not to invest in them. You can say, I'm going to take all the profits and take them offshore. But if you do that, and this might sound a little bit harsh, you are no better than the poacher or the smuggler. Colleagues, you are at the front line of this fight in the same way that customs police and rangers are in the front line. You are not a side player. The way in which you engage with your staff, the way in which you engage with your customers, the way in which you engage with local communities, support them, encourage them, invest in them, give them opportunities for employment, this is transformative. You have the opportunity to change the trajectory we're on. You have the opportunity to turn around the wildlife extinction crisis. And you're not starting from scratch. You just heard from Brett Tolman, a great example of what's been done through the Treadright Foundation. There are good examples out there, but we need more. Colleagues, the future of wildlife is in our hands. And we stand ready to work with you to make sure that your children or your grandchildren are not standing on this podium in 2050 and talking about elephants or rhinos or pangolins or lions or tigers or sharks or rays in the same way that we talk about dinosaurs and the dodo. It does not have to be that way. But if we're going to make sure that that scenario is not played out, we need all of you to join us in this fight. Thank you.